Brilliant. So we're, we're going to move on a little bit in a sense. So obviously, libraries like the British Library, like the National Library of Scotland, we've actually been around for hundreds of years. So we've been collecting things during that time. And obviously, a lot of that we never collected from the point of view of thinking about data, thinking about big data and making it available. So how do we now go about sort of converting a lot of those collections that we have um, into data so we can make them available? So we'll, we'll talk very quickly just a little bit about the library and its collections, how it came to be, so that you understand sort of the library and what it is we're looking at there. Um, work we're doing with digital collections, um, what we're now moving on to in terms of developing a digital scholarship service and how that sort of starting to make us think and reanalyze how we do things. So for example, for the past 20 years, we've done digitization to put images online. Now we're saying, well, actually, what does digitization look like when we look at it from the point of view of making that available as data and how to change digitization? And then a little bit about um, collections to data and, and back and forth. So just a very, very brief sort of potted history of the National Library of Scotland. We've been around since the late um, 1600s. Um, initially founded as a Faculty of Advocates Library, so this is a sort of uh, the, the legal profession in Scotland, really, and their, their professional body. 1710, the Copyright Act came along, so we became a copyright library. You're entitled to claim a copy of everything published in the UK. 1925, it got to the point where, obviously, sort of this legal body holding the what was essentially the national collection there decided this isn't really for us, we need a national library. So they gifted that to the nation about that time was around about three quarters of a million items in the collection. Um, and then obviously that has grown substantially over the past few years. So we were up to, I think in 2014, we were around about 24 million items, um, 120 miles of shelving. So that's the sort of scale we use. If you ever visit our George IV building um, in Edinburgh, this is sort of it while it was being built, note that the pavement doesn't actually correspond to the ground floor, which is interesting. Um, the reason, so I'll tell you about this though really, the, the, the history is obviously you always need to think about the collection that you're dealing with, how that collection came to be. You know, a lot of people think, well, you're, an, you're a legal deposit collection, surely you have everything. We don't. You know, this is, this is things that have been selected by a certain group of people, there's certain biases in that collection and so forth. So obviously as we now come to reselect what's in our collections for digitization, there's sort of... Um, even more bias can come into that. So as was mentioned in the previous talk, we then had the 2013 um, Legal Deposit Libraries regulations, and this essentially allowed us to move from collecting physical items to collecting digital items. Um, so they talked about the web archive, um, but then we also have um, all the sort of e-books and e-journals that we collect. So the vast majority now of um, journals, sort of serials come in electronically, as do um, a lot of e-books. So we're, we're sort of changing the way we collect. Um, that, that comes in sort of faster and faster every year um, than we've ever had before. So, so February this year, we just tipped over. So we're now sort of 30 million items um, and growing very, very fast. So. Where does that leave us in terms of what we want to do with it? Um, obviously, our, our vision ultimately would be, can we make all 30 million items available as data? You know, they're available as collections, they're available to be consulted, to be read, to be enjoyed, to be used, but actually how can we make them available for research and other purposes um, as data? And obviously, you know, I guess it goes without saying from our point of view, as openly as possible with as few restrictions as possible. So there's a few steps we've sort of taken over the past few years. We have a sort of rudimentary open data repository. I wouldn't necessarily visit it. There isn't too much in there. A lot of it is sort of metadata collections. Um, you know, we promote that for sort of research use. We've had quite a lot of creative reuse of our collections as well. We put our corporate data in there. If you want to see all our expenditure of our credit cards, um, our corporate credit cards, we, we, pu <laughs> we publish that openly as well. So, so that's all in there. And then just this year, we're now starting to sort of consider really as a library what, um, our, per or what our role is around digital scholarship. Um, and that's sort of why we have Sarah now as our first um, digital scholarship librarian. What guides us in terms of the work we do? So we're currently working through um, our current strategy known as The Way Forward 2015 to 2020. And one of the sort of quite ambitious goals that that has in it is it says by 2025, we will have one third of our collections available in digital format. Um, so that's something that we're doing, um, obviously working on very hard. As you can imagine, a lot of what we, we gather now comes in digitally. Um, so our collections grow quite quickly digitally that way. And then we sort of do digitization to top it up to the third as well. And really that sort of recognizes um, the library's going through a very, very big digital transition in how we move very much from a sort of physical on-premise service to a, um, an online worldwide um, digital service. 
So we sort of ask ourselves, well, where should we start? You know, where's, where's the best place to start making data? What can we do with this? So we have, obviously, as we talked about, this sort of flagship non-print legal deposit collection. So this, in, since we've been collecting in 2013, numbers around about 5 million e-books and e-journals on top of, obviously, the five, 500 terabytes of web archive as well. Um, so these are prime candidates for digital scholarship, sure, surely. You know, it'd be great to be able to um, do text and data mining on this. Alas, a bit like the restrictions they were talking about with the web archive in the previous presentation, um, we can't allow this. So when the, when the regulations were put together, unfortunately they sort of trump copyright legislation. So where with copyright in the 2014 exemption that hopefully you'll all be aware of that says anything you have the right to read, you have the right to text and data mine, because this comes into a different type of regulation, um, the Legal Deposit Library's non-print work regulation, that doesn't align with copyright. So we can't actually use those um, affordances through the copyright laws um, to, make, to make that available. And obviously we talked about the web archive as well. I think someone asked one of the questions just in terms of, well, are we going in the right direction? Are we trying to make this more open? So we've just had what's known as the post-implementation review um, undertaken by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport who oversee libraries in the UK. Um, basically reviewing this regulation and saying is it still fit for purpose and sort of the two big things that came out of that are one we want to see a change to make the web archive open you know everyone else's web archives are open the internet archive and things why can't ours be open um, and can we align our ebook and e-journal content with um, copyrights so that we can make it available for text and data mining so DCMS at some point in the future I'm not sure when but they'll be running a consultation about this so if you ever hear about a consultation on the post implementation review of non print works regulations please don't fall asleep it sounds a bit dull but it's your chance to sort of help us um, sort of make those changes um, so where next um, if we can't do those obviously then we start to look um, well what can we digitize so um, we put a lot of effort, a lot of money into our digitization, really scaling that up. So just to give you an example, so two years ago, we digitized over 100,000 that year, 128,000 items. Last year, up to 201,000, and we're sort of um, increasing this year by year. Um, that obviously creates digital images and metadata, which is what we've always, I guess, considered when we're digitizing. But now we start to think a little more about the data and how we make that available. We do what you might call traditional digitization, your sort of quality, your camera and your copy stand, and then we do our mass digitization as well. Now, sometimes people sort of turn their nose up at mass digitization and think, well, oh, that's bad, that's horrible, that's low quality, they're not taking care of things, they're just throwing it sort of through. Mass digitization, I think, or certainly the way we look at it, it's almost a bit like one of the definitions of big data. So if you take the definition of big data being basically, I can't work with the traditional tools I've used, the data is just too big for that, I have to change the way I work, the mass digitization, or I suppose you could call it big digitization, is the same. It's the same quality, but you're just saying we can't do this at the scale we used to do it anymore. So we have to just reinvent all our processes, all our workflows, all our equipment and so forth to actually um, be able to do things or to, or to do much more digitization. And then obviously we have sort of sound and moving image digitization we do as well. So to give you an example then of mass digitization, this is still very high quality um, digitization, 71 megapixel shutterless cameras, um, 100, 10, sorry, 10,000 images per day, all sort of quality controlled at page by page basis. It's still very, very high quality. We're just trying to make our workflows and our processes as efficient as possible. We run, because of that, we try, you know, cameras are expensive, so we keep them running from sort of seven in the morning till nine at night. So these are the sort of things that challenge in the library. We're, you know, we're a nine to five organization really, so we're trying to move that. Um, Working at scale, then obviously, what does that mean from a storage point of view? They mentioned non print legal, uh, the web archive is half a petabyte. Um, all our digitization now adds up to about another half a petabyte. The non print legal deposit collection is another one and a half petabytes. So, anyone who manages storage sort of starts totting this up and realizing we have an awful lot of storage. Um, plus, we keep three copies of all of this, or four copies actually, of the non print legal deposit um, collection. So we are in, particularly between the different legal deposit libraries, we're in tens of petabytes now. You know, we're, we're really storing at scale. Um, our own content, we keep three copies, one in Glasgow, one in Edinburgh, and a third copy in the cloud. Um, so that's sort of how we, how we preserve this content as well. And then just one um, very quick slide, just to, to go off to the side slightly. Um, we've been lucky we've got some AHRC funding. Um, we're working on a project with a number of other organisations, the British Library, National Library of Wales, RLUK and Information Studies at the University of Glasgow. 
basically asking this question, what if it were possible to search all digitized text and download a data set or corpus specific to you? So no one has ever, as far as we know, created a database of every text that has been digitized worldwide. You know, libraries are scaling up their digitization, um, but no one's actually coordinating this, bringing together a single list. So if you want to know if, if a book has been digitized, you have to go to Google Books, you have to go to Internet Archive, you have to go to Hattie Trust, you might find it, you might not. And even if you don't find it, it doesn't mean it isn't digitized somewhere. So would it be possible for us to bring this together, you know, as one big searchable service? And then from a sort of so digital scholarship point of view, wouldn't it be fab if you can go in there, do a search, cut, filter, query, get this corpus that's specific to what you want from all libraries across the world, hit a download button, and there's your data set. So essentially, this is what, what um, we're looking at. So this is funded by the AHRC at the moment. Um, we're running a couple of workshops, one in London on the 19th of June, I think it is, and one in Glasgow um, in December. So if you're actually interested in this topic and what it might enable you to do with your work, have a chat to me, because we'll see if we can get some invites um, to these events. So how do we go from digitizing items to turning them into data? Um, I'm going to talk a bit about our new digital scholarship service at the National Library of Scotland, um, some of the activity that's been taking place in the last couple of months, and also some of the broader questions that it's making us um, ask about ourselves as collectors. So our digital scholarship service has got five main objectives. Um, the first one is to enable the use of computational research methods with our collections. So that means making our collections available as data. Um, in doing this, we can then help to fulfill our second objective, which is to make sure that our collections are being used to their full potential. So we want to make sure that um, we're enabling all kinds of research with our collections. There's also an internal culture change element of the service, so we want to make sure that we're a library that understands digital scholarship. So we'll be setting up training sessions in the library and hopefully bringing in some academics as well to come and talk about your research with us. Um, and our fourth objective is to promote transparency in our data creation processes. I'm going to talk a bit more about that one in a minute. Um, lastly, and perhaps the most challenging one, um, we've set ourselves um, to anticipate the future of research. Um, and by this, I mean that um, we want to make sure that our data collections stand the test of time, um, that they're still relevant and useful, even when technologies change or methodologies change as well. So this is how we're positioning digital scholarship at the National Library. Um, as you'll see, it sits between our collections, computational methods and research activity. Um, so we've deliberately differentiated digital scholarship from National Library of Scotland digital scholarship um, to make it clear that this is about using our collections in research. And we're defining digital scholarship quite broadly as the use of computational methods and with National Library of Scotland collections to enable new forms of research. So what we're working on at the moment is making our collections data available. So Stuart mentioned that we've got a mass digitization program underway at the moment, um, and we've got huge amounts of OCR text and also images coming out of that. So we're working on making them available first. We've got some great collections coming up, including uh, a medical history of British India. We've got um, first, the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, some 19th century spiritualist newspapers, um, Scottish exam papers collections, and many more as well. So um, they'll be coming up around autumn time. Um, but we're also excited about making our other collections data available as well. So we've got um, great image collections. We're currently digitizing about 14,000 images from um, the McKinnon collection, um, along with the National Galleries. Um, we've got metadata collections that can be analyzed at scale. Um, we've got our corporate data that we make available that's from um, we're producing on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as many other collections data. Um, and we'll be working on them next. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we've been looking at how we make our collections available as data. Um, and so this means the digitized material, thinking about why we're digitizing in the first place. So digital scholarship presents us with a new use case for digitization. Um, we're not only now um, making our collections available for online image um, galleries, um, but we're also needing to generate um, different kinds of file formats for research purposes. Um, so on the left-hand side of the screen here, you can see a broad process of how we go from a print collection to a data collection. Um, and all the kinds of questions we need to ask in between. So what kind of file formats to be keeping and creating, um, how we compile a metadata document, and how we wrap all of this up and make it available online. 
We've also been looking at how we structure our data sets. So we want to make sure that our data collections um, are usable for people of many different skill levels, but also um, for different use cases. So we're wanting to make our collections data available in a few different formats and structures um, to enable that. And if you've got any particularly strong views on how you want your collections data structured, let us know, because there's no clear standard on how to do this at the minute. Um, so we'd be interested in any feedback. But there's a few examples there of what we've been um, talking about recently. So there's a few challenges of setting up a digital scholarship service. We're only a couple of months in and I can already fill aside quite happily with it. Um, setting up new workflows and, and changing processes is always quite fun because you're, you're making things work. Um, but it means changing the way that people are working at the moment and changing existing processes. Um, and it also means looking at our collections in new ways. Um, OCR is a challenge for us as well, so our mass digitisation programme isn't a single material digitisation programme, it's not a newspaper digitisation programme, it's an everything digitisation programme and that means all kinds of materials are going through it um, from all historical periods um, and so we're looking at the moment or in early stages of looking at how we might be able to have different OCR tools depending on different materials and how we might be able to embed that in our workflows. Um, we've also been looking at how, uh, what collections data looks like in the first place, so we're quite confident we know what that means for um, text or for images, but what does a digitised map look like as data? Um, what do our audio-visual collections look like as data? So that's kind of bubbling away on the back burner at the minute. And then there's also broader challenges around copyright that I think everybody faces where we can't make certain collections available um, or even with the TDM exception there's practical challenges around um, trans we're not allowed to transfer um, files to researchers for example for TDM um, so we need some kind of mediating interface there that we don't currently have to enable that. Um, so setting up our digital scholarship services encouraged us to ask um, a number of questions about ourselves as collectors and I wanted to um, finish up by um, sharing a few of them with you because I think they align quite nicely with some of the themes of this conference. Um, so firstly, um, the term collections as data has gained a lot of traction in the last few years and we're working to make our collections available in machine readable format. But that also means thinking about our data as collections and all of the challenges associated with that. So um, what constitutes a collection in the first place? Um, how do we package that up and structure it and preserve it and make it available? Um, I think we also need to start thinking about our metadata collections as collections in their own right and of independent interest. And we need to make sure that we don't lose the processes that our collections have undergone in making them available as data. That leads me into provenance. So this is something we've been thinking about a lot um, at the National Library of Scotland in the last couple of months. So um, we want to make sure that our data collection, or that our readers understand um, where our, our data collections have been produced, um, what processes they've undergone and why they exist in the first place. In the first place. Um, but how we do that in um, an area that has few existing standards is a challenge. Uh, so we want to make sure that our data collections are um, as, as rich and as interesting to the data historians of the future as our print collections are to book historians now. Um, so one of the ways we're wanting to do this is by making information available alongside our data collections about the decision-making process behind why an item has been digitised or turned into data um, so that researchers can contextualise our collections more clearly. That leads into the responsibilities of libraries. Um, so libraries have traditionally been acquirers. Um, we purchase items in or they're donated to us. Um, we then describe them to supposedly objective, neutral standards, and of course that's problematic in itself. Um, and we then make them available. Um, but with this um, digital transition that we're going through, we're now seeing that as well as this, libraries are becoming producers of our own collections. Um, so our digitisation programme, for example, doesn't only produce huge amounts of OCR text as data, um, but we've got data coming off the process more broadly. So we've got data coming off the scanners, off the OCR software, off the digital production tools. Um, we also produce metadata along with other libraries and we produce corporate data on a day-to-day -day basis. So what are our responsibilities as data producers? Um, how do we describe our own data and convey information about um, how and why and where our data has been produced? And how do we contextualise our own processes? Um, how do we make sure that libraries retain their position as a trusted source of information when we're producing that information ourselves? 
And I think one of the solutions here has got to be around transparency, and that's why we've put it in one of our, our five objectives of our service. We want to make sure that we contextualise our collections and we need to be doing this more. Um, but that then leads me into standards. Um, again, there's no um, set way of doing this across the board, and there probably needs to be some kind of discussion across the board with, across the board with libraries about how we can do this in a um, consistent and um, coherent way. Uh, so lastly, um, digital scholarship and collections as data is a disruptive influence in the library. Um, I think a long overdue one, um, in the same way that digital scholarship brings together academics from areas that haven't traditionally worked alongside one another, uh, so it is in the library and we're seeing that teams are coming together to produce our collections as data and working together in new ways. Um, and it also means thinking about our collections in new ways too. Um, and all of this means you're visiting the idea of what the library is. Um, so um, producing or um, making our collections as data available, um, whether that's at a national library level or at a global data set level that Stuart was talking about, um, gives us opportunities to rethink the library and to look again at the structure of libraries and the roles within them and the skills within them. Um, we've got opportunities to um, look at the collections themselves and think about um, things like diversity within them and what's missing and what gaps there are and what that absence can tell us. Um, it encourages us to look at discovery again and think about how we're finding things and also what we find when we get there. Um, and it means looking at the transparency between libraries and their users and thinking about the, um, the conditions that our data and digitised collections are being produced in. Um, so those are some of the broader questions we've been asking ourselves um, as we've been setting up the Digital Scholarship Service. Um, we'd be interested in your questions and your views on these too. Thank you.